Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and happy birthday to GDPR, which is five years old in terms of effectiveness today. Um, welcome to the latest of Field Fisher's Privacy webinar series. My name is Renzo Marchini, and I am a partner in the data and privacy team in London. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, regular listeners will know that we normally schedule these webinars roughly on a monthly basis. Indeed, the next one is already scheduled for early June, more on that later. But occasionally, events come along which mean that many of our clients have the immediate same worries. And we put one on in short order, which we've done this week as a result, of course, of the breaking news um, from Monday which is the fine of 1.2 billion euros on Meta for transfers of data out of the EU to the US, uh, and more importantly, the suspension um, of the transfer, the order suspending um, the transfer addressed to Meta. Many of you we know are concerned about this uh, and what that means for your own organization's international transfers, and so, we hope to reassure to the extent reassurance is possible in these uncertain times, and we'll focus on practical steps that can be done. I'm joined by two colleagues. I'm particularly delighted to welcome our brand new partner, Sarah Tedstone, who's been with us only for, well, not even two weeks yet. So um, brilliant that she's jumped into this with, with us. And Sarah and I are joined by a senior associate in our team, uh, Camille Ebden. So what we're going to be covering today will be, I will set the scene. Now, the scene, the saga that's led to this week's um, decision is, um, is an old one. It started in 2013, um, so I'll be brief. Uh, the saga, I think, will have some legs left in it and will continue for a while longer. Um, Sarah will be discussing in a little bit of detail the decision itself. Um, in particular, the discussion on supplementary measures. Um, part of we, what we think is going to be a, a consequence of the decision will be an acceleration of the adoption of the EU-US data privacy framework, which Camille will be um, describing for us and what that means for organisations. We'll have some key takeaways, trying to make those as practical as possible. And at the end, I'll wrap up with what it means for other countries, not just transfers to the US, and also what it means for transfers from the UK. So just if I can work the slides. A reminder of chapter five of GDPR, um, which prohibits transfers of data out of the EU and UK GDPR, of course, similarly prohibiting transfers out of the UK, unless the transfer destination is a country which has been declared adequate, or a scheme that's been declared adequate, like Privacy Shield was, and the framework hopefully will be, or if you haven't got adequacy, then you go to the next limb, which are appropriate safeguards, common ones being SCCs, but of course, Binding corporate rules also available for um, some organisations will have those. And lastly, and um, the DPC, the, um, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, uh, did discuss the application of possible derogations such as public interest grounds or such as consent or necessity for performance of a contract, which um, it will be available if the other two limbs are not available. So that's a recap of the main legislative scheme. So the saga. So this all started literally 10 years ago <laughs> when Snowden made his revelations, as people know, about the NSA having backdoors and prism into various tech companies' platforms, in particular Facebook. And because Facebook was particularly in the crosshairs of Mr. Schrems, he um, took action again or tried to take action against them by complaining to the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. The DPC refused to take any action on the basis that Facebook were relying on what was then in place, 
called Safe Harbor. Um, in 2015, the refusal um, to bring action was challenged in the courts and it ended up in, as people know, the Court of Justice of the European Union and Safe Harbor was declared invalid in Schrems 1. Um, a couple of things happened. Um, Facebook signed SECs and Privacy Shield was adopted. So in May 2016, the DPC began a case to test whether or not reliance on the SECs was itself sufficient to protect data. And that's the case, and my next slide will see that ends up in Schrems 2. It took a long time to get to the CJEU. In the meantime, GDPR, five years ago today, came into effect in May. So in July 2020, the Privacy Shield was declared invalid, but the SECs survived subject to an assessment being done as to whether they protect the data, and if not, they put in place of additional measures, so-called supplementary measures, to make sure that the data was still protected up to the European standards. Um, in June 2021, we had new EU SECs, um, partly put in place to update SECs for GDPR purposes, but also to deal with some of the issues in SHREMS. And we also had regulatory guidance from the European Data Protection Board on actually how to do risk assessments and actually how to put in place supplementary measures. And the DPC began to properly enforce or try to enforce against Facebook, backed by the Schrems II judgment. In July 2022, it circulated its draft decision addressed to Facebook to the other supervisory authorities that were, quote, concerned, quote, which is pretty much what was every other supervisory authority in Europe because Facebook is um, all prevalent. And, and it went through a process which Sarah will be talking about where there was possible dis the worst disagreement between the different regulators. And it took a while before the European Data Protection Board resolved that disagreement and told the Irish DPC what to actually find and do in terms of sanctions. And in May, just early this week, the decision was published. Meta had it a week or two in advance of the publication. So over to Sarah to talk us through exactly what the DPC said. Hello, um, lovely to be here, as Renzo said, in my first week. So, yes, I'm going to talk to you now about what the decision actually says. So um, there might have been a fine. Have you heard that there might have been a fine? Yes, qu quite a big one, the biggest one. So a fine of 1.2 billion euros um, required by the EDPB. So the DPC was required to, to put this fine in place, um, given the mechanism and the criteria, but decided on the sum itself. Um, also, the decision said that Meta should suspend any future transfers of personal data to the US within a time period that currently would expire in October and also to, to deal with previous transfers, so to bring existing processing or previous processing in compliance with um, GDPR in a timescale that would currently expire in November. So Meta, the first thing to say is before we go into the detail is Meta has indicated that it intends to appeal, it's disappointed and has applied for a stay. Um, that probably is going to be dealt with in a hearing in Ireland and it would remain to be seen if any or all elements of this decision would be stayed in the meantime. So the timetable very much at the moment um, is a preliminary one. So um, the decision, you may know if you've looked at it, hundreds of pages, um, EDPB um, decision, hundreds of pages, well, 74 pages, but referenced hundreds of other pages of relevant documents. So there's been a lot to consider. We've had a few days to think about it and to, to form views about it. 
Um, a positive thing to say is that I think the DPC recognising the importance of this decision attempted to ensure, you know, the broadest possible applicability, bringing it up to date, considering things that have come into play, you know, since this started, uh, as Renzo, Renzo indicated in his timescale. So, for example, they've considered the up-to-date SCCs uh, and made their decision relevant to that extent. So, the fine, obviously, fine, big talking point. Um, but the first thing to mention is there was a lot of disagreement about this across Europe. So the DPC had not originally intended to fine Meta. They had said this was not needed to achieve compliance, that Meta had attempted to comply with um, the law in good faith. Meta itself had said that it would be inconsistent and unfair for there to be a fine. Others had not been fined. But some authorities, um, you know, in particular Austria, France, Germany and Spain, felt that a fine was necessary and the EDPB agreed with them. The main reasoning seems to be the deterrent effect uh, for the fine here. Interesting, DPC reluctant to fine, required to fine ultimately, but they are the beneficiary of this. Um, they receive the, the amount that would be subject to, to, to payment from Meta. Then the transfer element. Um, again, disagreement about this across Europe. The DPC had wanted to suspend future transfers, but it didn't want to interfere with past transfers, instead thinking it was more appropriate for individuals to ask for erasure of their data if they wanted to. I think mainly because Meta had said the transfers are necessary for the service, it's part of the, the business um, and effectively it, all it may be able to do to bring previous transfers into compliance is effectively to delete them. Um, some authorities objected to this quite strongly in some cases. France and Germany ob objected and wanted the past transfers to be addressed and the EDPB agreed with them. Considering um, discussion here about whether deletion actually would be compliant with uh, GDPR laws and so not being specific about what needs to be done about previous transfers but instead putting the onus on, on Meta to make sure that it, it puts the position of, about previous uh, transfers in, in, in a situation where they are compliant effectively. Um, Camille's going to mention future, the future position about the framework, which um, is obviously a bit of hope in this situation. Um, and that may mean that at some point, uh, Meta's processing is compliant in any event. So, so that's broadly what the decision said. If we could um, go to the next slide, I'm going to delve into it a little bit Thanks, more deeply. Sarah, thank you. I just forgot to mention one point at the beginning, which is we will have some time at the end for Q&A, um, but also there is a question function in GoToWebinar, and if people want to put questions into that, we may be able to take them as we uh, go through. Um, so please do ask questions as we go along. Sorry, Sarah, over to you again. No problem. So let's delve into the detail here because there are some really interesting parts of this decision. Um, I think it might be useful for me to explain a little bit of the background. And this is a little geeky, forgive me, but I think it's useful to help to understand the context of the decision, which I think will then be useful when you're thinking, well, what about me? You know, how does this apply to me? So the background, some of the key um, issues here are um, the uh, government surveillance, foreign surveillance effectively in the US. And this is dealt with under a couple of provisions um, referred to in the slides. So section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and also um, Executive Order 12333. And we have two programs under section 702, namely PRISM and Upstream. I'll just deal with them briefly because I think it, it really explains the context. So um, CISA, authorizes the collection of uh, surveillance, section 702 specifically about non-US individuals. Although there is some oversight through courts under FISA, section 702 is um, not targeted, it's not specific, and authorization can be for sig significant periods. Um, I'll deal with executive order 12333 now, and go back to the programs, PRISM and Upstreams. 
the uh, executive order is another method for authorizing surveillance collection and that really deals with um, the uh, sort of well one thing to say here is that a lot of this is classified we've gathered some of the information through a working body working group that got together in 2013 after um, Snowden the European Commissioner and the US government got together and discussed we have some information in the leaked documents and we also have um, the NSA has confirmed certain elements so the executive order um, deals with uh, the internet, uh, attacking the internet effectively or uh, accessing the internet. And PRISM and Upstream Snowden um, disclosed some documents that um, indicated that PRISM and Upstream existed and there is a difference between them. So PRISM effectively is a situation where a government, uh, the government may come to META, a, a party that's subject to the provisions and say to them, I have an email address, I have a number, I want you to give me everything you've got about this identifiable person in or out in storage and this is secret, you mustn't tell them that I'm asking you for it. Upstream is um, different, upstream effectively is the NSA copying and filtering information through the um, physical uh, backbone of the internet, again secretly. So the a uh, critical part of this decision was the DPC considering that PRISM was the key problem for META here. Clearly, um, to justify transfers, META, which is subject to Section 702 and PRISM, effectively has to deal with a situation where it's legally obliged when requested to provide information about an identifiable individual, everything they've got. Um, they meta effectively said that they had technical measures to deal with the other parts upstream and executive order 1233 and although the dpc didn't have to directly consider those because they said prism was the stumbling block there, there were the indication is there was some sympathy for those arguments so so consequently meta's in this situation where it has these requests it has to comply um, the measures it had in place were deemed to be insufficient to deal with that situation. And to be clear, the measures it had were fairly significant. It had up-to-date SCCs in place, it had intergroup data transfer agreements, it had TIAs, it had significant supplementary measures in terms of organizational, technical and legal measures, but they couldn't get over this, this PRISM type request situation. Beyond that, the decision DPC indicates that the risk-based approach um, to dealing with supplementary measures still exists. So not for meta in this situation, but if, if, you're, if you're not in the um, factual situation of, of, this situa of, of meta's case with PRISM, it may be that you'll be able to deal with the risk-based approach, and I'll explain that in a, in a bit more detail later, but a really interesting point from the decision. And also, uh, um, the DPC has confirmed that derogations, particularly consent, may be available as an exception, although not available to um, meta in this situation, in this case particularly. So next slide, Renzo. Uh, thank you. So let's just delve a little bit more into the supplementary measures before Camille gives you some information about the hope that's coming with the framework. So what, what did Meta have in place. So it had the SCCs and it had extra things as well. Well, it had significant um, compliance effectively. It had for the organizational measures, it had policies, guidelines, transparency reports, oversight and notification procedures, and teams, several teams, reviewing government requests for personal data. In the technical side, it had comprehensive security standards you know, state-of-the-art stuff, really high standards, and particularly high level of encryption, which it said, and it would appear to be, were significant in dealing with issues about some of the surveillance legislation, as I mentioned. For the legal side, it had a legal process to fight unlawful requests for disclosure. It had the SCCs, which um, had methods to enforce rights and challenges to US, to US law. So, the measures were not criticised per se in this decision. The decision expressly went through these one by one, 
and indicated that they just couldn't compensate for that directory government, government request about an identifiable individual under PRISM. So I think that's probably enough about the decision at the moment, and I'm going to come back to the takeaways when Camille has given you a little bit of hope about the Before future. Before we go to, to Camille, another question, which actually, nice first question nicely reminds me that I forgot a bit of housekeeping at the, keeping at the beginning. Slides will be made available. Yeah, thank you to the person that asked that question, as will a recording, which will also be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and then we've got a substantive question for you, Sarah, which is, um, does PRISM, I think they mean, uh, so forgive me, the, the questioner, um, does FISA 702 apply to financial services companies? So the um, Section 702 applies to electronic communication service providers. And again, we have a little bit of doubt about what that means. We have, some of this is classified, but as I mentioned before, we have a little bit of information about this. The DPC referred to this specifically in the decision. And what is clear is that it definitely uh, applies to internet service providers and probably big tech companies. So there's, there's a list that's been accepted really as, as being relevant here. And it's, you know, your Microsoft, Yahoo, I'm looking at the decision for the, the full list that's actually referred to there, Google, Facebook, PalTalk, AOL, Apple, Skype, and YouTube. But um, there is some discussion about whether this would go, that definition of an electronic communication service provider would go so wide as to even include, for example, employers with employee email systems effectively. So we could spend a whole webinar talking about what organisations come within this definition. We can help you offline if, if you would like to discuss this, but there is even debate amongst the US legal community about you know, who does come within this, dis this description, but it is critical to what we're talking about. Thank you, and Camille. Thank you, thanks Sarah, thanks Renzo. Hi everyone. So, is it the EU-US data privacy framework and adequacy to the rescue for US transfers? So, by way of reminder, if adequacy is granted to transfers under the framework, then because those transfers to framework certified US recipients would be deemed adequate, there would be no need for TIAs or supplementary measures for those transfers. So, firstly, where actually are we in the adequacy process? So, to recap, on uh, the 25th of March last year, the EU and US announced that they'd reached an agreement in principle on a proposed EU-US data privacy framework. And as part of this agreement in principle, the US committed to introducing new privacy and civil liberties safeguards regarding its signal intelligence programs in order to address the concerns raised in SHREMS 2. Then in October last year, President Biden signed the Executive Order for Enhanced Safeguards for United States Intelligence Activities. And this essentially directed the US to implement its commitments under the proposed data privacy framework. On the same date in October, the US Attorney General also signed a regulation which established within the US Department of Justice a Data Protection Review Court. Then if we jump forwards to December 2022, the European Com Commission issued a draft adequacy decision for transfers to the US under the proposed data privacy framework. And this was on the basis that the measures laid out in Biden's executive order, once fully adopted and implemented, and complemented by the regulation on the Data Protection Review Court, would be enough to ensure an adequate level of protection for personal data transferred from controllers or processors in the EU to framework certified organizations in the US. So since then, both the EDPB and the European Parliament have published non-binding views on the draft adequacy decision. The EDPB's non-binding opinion carries more sway and this welcomed improvements under the framework whilst also raising some concerns and requesting some clarifications. However, they also set out that they did not expect the framework to replicate European data protection law, 
and several commentators have been optimistic that the concerns that the EDPB raised can be resolved. So we're now at the stage where we're waiting to see if the European Commission will issue a revised draft adequacy decision. In any event, we won't have adequacy granted for the framework unless the final draft is approved by a committee of member states' representatives. To be approved, 55% of EU countries, so 15 out of the 27, representing at least 65% of the total EU population, have to approve the decision. So what about the DPC's decision? How do we think that's going to affect the expected timeline for adequacy? Well, when the draft adequacy decision was announced in December, the expectation had broadly been that adequacy would be granted for the framework by summer this year. EU officials had even mentioned that it might be in place by July 2023. So given the DPC's latest decision, there's now bound to be a lot of increased pressure on the European Commission to get to a position of adequacy for the framework as soon as possible. So the hope is still very much that adequacy will be announced soon and within the, the next few months. However, Max Schrems organisation NOYB have made it clear that as soon as any adequacy decision is announced, they intend to issue challenges. However, any such challenges would take time to be considered by the CJEU. So we would expect at least a period where the framework could be relied upon before any CJEU decision could either dismiss the challenges or rule in their favour. So of course, it remains to be seen if it will merely be a temporary solution. But something that will help in at least the short term once it comes through. Uh, next slide, please, Renzo. OK, so another key question that's been cropping up is how would the framework actually work? So much like the EU and the US, uh, sorry, the EU and the US Privacy Shield, the framework will be based on a system of certification where US organisations will have to commit to a set of privacy principles issued by the US Department of Commerce. And the US has confirmed that these principles will remain substantively the same as the Privacy Shield principles. A US organization would have to certify, self-certify its adherence to the principles by sending a self-certification submission to the Department of Commerce. And it would then have to recertify each year. Again, the US have set out that the process to self-certify and recertify will remain substantively the same as the process under Privacy Shield. So this means the process will likely involve preparing certain documentation, designating a contact point, developing a verification mechanism, in addition to the submission of a self-certification to the Department of Commerce. And that, would, that process would take a US organization likely several months as it does in the Privacy Shield context. A US organization will be able to rely on the framework from the date it's placed on the data privacy framework list by the Department of Commerce. So what about enforcement? Well, to be eligible for certification, a US organization must be subject to the investigatory and enforcement powers of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, or the US Department of Transportation. Currently, the FTC has the power to impose administrative orders, seek court orders, and issue civil penalties of up to $40,000 per day for continuing violations of the Privacy Shield. So they would likely have similar powers under the framework. Will companies who already have Privacy Shield be able to get framework certified more easily? Well, the short answer is yes, they will. The information from the US government sets out that um, US organizations who are already Privacy Shield certified, who wish to be certified under the framework, will need to comply with the framework principles once those enter into effect. And this will include updating their privacy policies to, among other things, refer to their commitment to comply with the framework principles rather than the Privacy Shield principles. And they'll have to do this as soon as possible after the framework principles effective date and at least within three months, but it'll be a much easier process for them. So what will the advantages of the framework be over say the standard contractual clauses? 
Well, once a US organization is framework certified, then transfers to them of EU data would be adequate with no need for the EU exporter and the US importer to do TIAs or consider supplementary measures for those transfers. Will there be any disadvantages? Well, as mentioned, the framework certified organizations in the US will have to be subject to enforcement from the FTC or the US Department of Transportation, including the potential for large fines. And there will be the need to annually recertify. But of course, there are large enforcement risks for non-compliance under the SCCs, as we've just seen with the meta decision and administrative hurdles with the need to keep TIAs up to date. So we suspect for many organizations, the advantages of the framework will considerably, considerably outweigh the disadvantages. Final point on this topic, as mentioned, it, it is very much expected that there will be challenges as soon as adequacy is granted um, to the framework. So there is a possibility that the framework will be a short term fix like the privacy shield before it, but we'll just have to wait and see. So moving on to the next slide, please, Renzo. Uh, before we do that, Camille, there's a, there's a question which, to be honest, um, I think it's a tricky one. So I'll, I'll, I've had five, 10 minutes to think about this. So let me, let me try and answer it, um, which is why would the framework retroactively make prior transfers okay? So transfers, let's say Facebook sign up, Inc, Facebook Inc sign up to the framework once it's published, why does that remove any issue in relation to data that's already in the US? And I think my answer to, to that is, um, well, first of all, the framework commitment will include any data that originated even prior to the certification. Um, and whilst then there might be a technical breach, and actually in the Facebook example, that is now being sanctioned. Um, if you imagine another company that hasn't yet been sanctioned and have signed up to, or the recipient has signed up to the framework, I think there would be also, it would be a member state by member state issue, but I can't imagine many regulators enforcing something which has in effect, in terms of the fundamental rights of the individual, been fixed. So. Um, whether there's a public law consideration in a member state which prohibits that, but I think in practice it's it's just simply not going to happen. I think. <laughs> Camille. Thanks, thanks, Renzo. Okay, so a lot of companies have been um, using the Biden executive order from October as increasing the protections available for transfers to the US and had been referring to the order in their TIAs. However, the extent that the Biden order can be relied upon in the TIAs has now been called into question following comments that the DPC have made in their latest meta decision. So to briefly recap, Biden's executive order essentially directed the US to implement its privacy commitments under the framework. The order doesn't replace existing US surveillance legislation Instead, it aims to add additional layers of protection to address the failings that the CJEU identified in SHREMS 2, and in particular to add safeguards for US intelligence activities, um, aiming to restrict these activities to what's necessary and proportionate, handling requirements for personal data collected through intelligence activities, and extending legal oversight and compliance officials' responsibilities to ensure that appropriate actions are taken to remediate incidents of non-compliance. And thirdly, to create a two-layer redress mechanism to ensure that complaints concerning the legality of US intelligence activities can be reviewed. However, it's worth noting that an executive order can be overturned by a subsequent president as has previously been demonstrated by former President Donald Trump in 2017. Also in October, Max Schrems and NOYB were quick to set out that they did not believe the order would satisfactorily address the issues raised in Schrems 2, particularly in terms of proportionality and the provision of true redress. But what has the DPC now said about the Biden order? Well, in their meta decision, they referred to the fact that the, the new redress mechanism under the order can only be engaged by a qualifying complaint and originating in a state that's been designated as a qualifying state. And they note that to date, the EU has not been designated as a qualifying state. 
and indeed to the DPC's knowledge, no designations at all have yet been made. They also highlight several other aspects of the redress mechanism that have not been completely implemented yet, including that no judges have yet been appointed to the Data Protection Review Court. So they therefore said that on that basis, it's clear that the, the new redress mechanism introduced by the order is not yet accessible by EU citizens and the remedial scheme contemplated by the Biden order is not in fact operational. They also concluded that the activities and practices of the intelligence agencies cannot be said to have changed materially or immediately on the 7th of October last year, which is when the Biden order was signed, and that the risk to the fundamental rights and freedoms of EU citizens that were identified in the Schrems II judgment have not yet been addressed. So the judgment from the DPC or the decision from the DPC therefore highlights the difficulties in using the Biden executive order measures to support a TIA at the moment, unless and until they're fully operational. However, if we once we get adequacy, then companies will, of course, be able to rely on the framework. And for those that stick to the SCCs, the measures in the Biden order should then be operational and be able to support future TIAs. So with that, I'll hand over to Sarah now for some key takeaways. Uh, except I've got a question, oh, um, which again, yeah. I, I know the answer to. Camille, you may not, um, uh, which is, and I will quickly answer rather than to, to, save, to save time, which is, um, can financial services companies certify to the framework? And for people that are in the financial services industry, you will, you will know that they could never sign up to Privacy Shield because one of the requirements was that you are under the jurisdiction you were under, had to be under the jurisdiction of either the FTC or the Department of Transfer, Transport, and that is the same for framework. So yes, yeah, the framework will not be a panacea for financial services companies um, to the extent their activities in relation to data are regulated by the SEC and not the FTC or the DOT. Um, and now I would definitely hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Camille, for, for a little bit of hope in this situation, a little bit of relief. Um, so I'm now going to deal with the position. So you've heard about the decision, the complications of it. We've told you about what's coming. So what should you be doing now? Um, what's, what's our advice? What are our recommendations about this? So firstly, I would say, as I always do, just make sure your general compliance is there. Have you got a compliance plan that's up to date? Have you got a data map, a ROPA? You're looking here at locations, transfers coming in or out um, and locations involved. And if you're challenged about this, you know, you, your data map is going to be the, the compliance document really that you'd have to rely on to, to justify your um, analysis about this. Um, Apart from that, the SECs are definitely still valid. Um, a little bit of debate from the DPC in this area, but making it clear that um, in Schrems 2, it had been absolutely clear that they are still valid as a legal in instrument. And the DPC sort of indicating that they had um, attempted to suggest the difficulty about US transfers generally, but um, the decision in Schrems 2 definitely that this should be um, analysis on a case by case basis and that, that still remains the position. Um, you will still need at the moment to have proper TIAs or TRAs for, for UK personal data if you haven't already and consider supplementary measures. So remembering this three stage test that the DPC confirmed was still appropriate is the um, country um, that, of, that you're transferring to essentially equivalent. Um, if not, can the SCCs deal with the problems? If they don't deal with all of the problems, then you need to be looking at the supplementary measures. Um, we've identified that the risk-based approach or test is still relevant here. So um, I will deal with US specifically in a moment, but uh, your consideration of section 702 in particular might be, be crucial about that. I would mention here your technical measures, particularly end-to-end -end encryption. Um, it was clear that Meta relied on this significantly for arguments about 
um, you know, other parts of Section 702, the upstream program or the Executive Order 12333 that exploits vulnerabilities in telecoms infrastructure. And clearly, um, uh, technical measures, security measures might be solutions to that. So I would say, you know, really consider end-to-end -end encryption if it's a possibility for you and uh, isn't already um, uh, something that you are uh, considering. So, and Sarah, sorry when to interject, next... but there's a, there's, a, there's a very pertinent question here, which which I think is um, is, is probably uh, subject to a very simple answer, but it's a key question. Given the significant amount of controls in place by Meta, and the fact they had no choice but to be subject to Section 702, what more could they have done? Yes, so there is discussion in the decision about there being significant compliance and any criticism that there was was not about there being any willful non-compliance, if anything, negligence. Um, and, you know, the su supplementary measures, although the consideration, you know, was ultimately because of the PRISM uh, situation that they were not enough, the uh, DPC didn't go any further to say what more could have been done. In fact, there's an interesting commentary right at the very end of the decision where the DPC suggests there is a suggestion possibly that it's concerned about transfers to the US generally, but the position remains that they're not they're not, I'm going to deal with this in a moment, but we're not saying that you know all transfers to the US are now um, invalid. So it, it is something that you have to look at case by case. Um, where you are, I think the DPC makes it clear, uh, their comment was that if you are an internet platform falling within the definition of an electronic communication service provider subject to Section 702 PRISM, they even go, they are that specific, then you might be in a similar position to Meta. But that's why it's it's clear that we talk about, look at this as a fact, decision on the facts and, you know, how you can distinguish yourself from that. Lots of questions on end-to-end -end encryption, so I'm going to take two to myself quickly here. First of all, please explain what it is, which uh, is, is the idea that you know if you actually get, cut the cable and you look at what the data is, it is encrypted. You know, during transit, it is encrypted. But of course, once at the receiving end, the whole point that why it's not good enough and why it was not good enough. The second question here: um, why was end-to-end -end encryption not good enough to avoid, for Meta to then avoid sanction? Is because when it arrives, it's no longer encrypted because it actually needs to be used, um, and so that's that, and so it won't be a panacea for everyone. I hope we're not giving that impression, but it's just an additional element that can be done to. Um, to, to go some way to assuring uh, regulators, which probably cuts across the points you're going to make in a moment, Sarah. Back to you. Yes. So, so, so for the prison situation, so a government body is coming to you saying, here's an email, here's a, a number, phone number to identify this individual, give me everything you've got. Encryption's not going to help with that. So that's why, yeah. it, you know, Meta, Meta failed here. But as Renzo said, if we're talking about the NSA uh, intercepting something that's in transit, if it's encrypted, then hopefully there's nothing they can do with it. And I, there is also discussion in the decision that if, if there's ever a situation where you can, where somebody, um, you're transferring the data to an organization that doesn't actually need to see what the data says, if they don't need the key to encrypted data, then that might, might be a similar situation. But, you know, the circumstances where that may be applied are likely to be rare. Okay, so um, next slide then, Renzo, if, if we're happy to move I on. I've, I have moved on, I think. Oh, thank you, sorry. Yep. I think my mind's lagging a little You're bit. Lagging. Thank you, yep. Taz, yes. Um, so looking at then the US specifically, are all transfers to the US impossible? I think I've already indicated that's not what the decision is saying and that's not what we're saying. I think you do, where you have a US um, uh, context so you are transferring to the US or you're a US organization and receiving personal data you do need to seriously consider the extent to which section 702 FISA and PRISM especially apply to you also the upstream program under section 702 and the executive order 12333 that I've referred to but again there is a possible suggestion it's not something that you can take from the decision definitely there's a possible suggestion that technical and security measures might be an answer there but if PRISM applies to you then there may be difficulties if you come within the definition of an electronic communication service provider. But if not, if that doesn't apply to you, then you can look 
it's a risk-based approach so we're looking at SCCs and supplementary measures looking at you know whether there is actually any interference with rights in your case and what you need to do um, and um, otherwise no criticism per se of the measures that Meta had in place um, there is the possibility slight possibility of consent as a derogation to be used um, I think there is a practice in Austria in particular where um, consent for transfers are sort of mingled in with cookies platforms. Um, you know, they're not popular. I think everybody groans when they're, they're faced with these regularly. So throwing in transfer consents as well, I mean, the extent to that would work is, is uh, uh, doubtful, I think. But um, to mention derogations very much are an exception. Um, the implication or the, the uh, consideration in this decision was that Meta also had bulk, um, bulk, bulk um, interception, uh, massive numbers of individuals, personal data and special category data, systematic, repetitive and ongoing, and that a derogation couldn't apply in those circumstances. Um, there is the suggestion that the UK is involved in, in bulk surveillance too, and we have adequacy, but, you know, that's another topic for consideration. But anyway, there is, you know, we would be remiss not to mention that for uh, specific situations in um, exceptional circumstances, uh, derogation may be available. Um, Camille mentioned limitations on this, but I think if we're looking at a risk-based approach, reference in your TIAs and your um, investigations and analysis to both Biden's executive order and the expected framework, showing that your future proofing, keeping an eye on developments, um, there's no harm in doing that. It shows that you understand the risks in your business and you're up to date about the position. Needless to say, um, US organizations should be keeping an eye on what's going on and getting ready to um, sign up. Um, I think that's it. If if we can go to the last slide, and I'll deal with this quickly. Um, you might ask us, um, does this mean, does this decision mean there's going to be lots of enforcement and other fines, especially? I think reading through the process and the decisions that we have, that there is a lot of comfort to be gleaned here. Um, the position about the fine I, I indicated the DPC and most other EU regulators didn't advocate for a fine in this case and other organizations haven't been fined the EDPB wanted it on these facts for Meta and similarly for the um, uh, enforcement of the transfers the stay and um, requirement to bring previous transfers into compliance there was disagreement again amongst the regulators about that we've got future solutions imminently so the extent to which there's an appetite from regulars to to bring other enforcement in this area remains to be seen but i think a lot of comfort to be gained from that thank you thank you uh, thank you very much sarah um so transfers from the eu to the US um, have been discussed a lot this week, but of course, the US is just one of the non-adequate countries out there. Uh, the adequate countries on the map in front of you um, are the green ones. Uh, so you will see that there's lots of big destination countries, um, India, China, which are not adequate. And what does that mean for those? Well. Um, the rationale of Schrems 2 applies equally to transfers everywhere, which is non-adequate. And one of the points which Meta put in their reaction, which I will, uh, which I've quoted on the screen in front of you, um, written by the Chief Legal Officer and the Director of Public Affairs, the, the latter, of course, well known to UK listeners. Um, Nick Clegg, an ex-Deputy Prime Minister from about 10 or so years ago. Um, at a time when the internet is fractured under pressures from authoritarian regimes, like-minded democracies should work together to promote and defend an open internet. No country has done more than the US to align with European rules, while transfers continue largely unchallenged to countries such as China. And I wonder what Meta have in mind when they talk about China and one of their social media 
competitors beginning with T. Um, so yes, the rationale applies to, to other countries. Um, and in other countries, we don't have the offing of a framework which will come uh, later this, uh, this summer as, as expected. So the takeaways that Sarah went through apply equally to all your data transfers and, and the um, maybe the reassurance that it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get a heavy hand of regulators now immediately jumping on everything else that's going on um, also applies equally uh, to other transfers. Um, we've had a couple of questions actually in the chat about the UK. So let me tell you about our views on what the UK is going to be doing here. Now, um, the decision doesn't have direct implica implication for anyone anywhere except for Facebook Ireland or Meta Platforms Ireland. Um, it certainly doesn't have any persuasive effect in the UK. It, um, you know, we're not no longer in the EU. Um, but substantively, of course, UK GDPR is exactly the same as EU GDPR. And we are in a position also where the Schrems 2 interpretation of appropriate safeguards requiring supplementary measures, Schrems 2 is binding in the UK because that was a decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union that was handed down um, before the end of the Brexit transition period. So it becomes part of EU retained law and UK domestic law. So Schrems 2 is binding. But the ICO has shown itself to be more flexible and more express on risk-based approach than the EDPB do in their recommendations um, in its transfer risk assessment, as it calls it, not TIA, but TRA for the UK, um, guidance of last year. We also have in the pipeline a um, reform of UK data protection law where we begin to diverge a little bit from EU GDPR, hopefully not so much as to remove adequacy. Um, but we do have a data protection bill going through Parliament at the moment. One of the changes to that is indeed to allow a greater flexibility under Article, 80, uh, Article 46 of UK GDPR, which um, will be replaced. Article 46 will be replaced by a new provision which reads um, summarising the key points, that a controller, an exporter, acting reasonably and proportionately, it's lovely words for lawyers to get their hands uh, around, reasonably proportionately consider that a data protection test has been fulfilled using, uh, and then you can use the, um, the, the SECs or the IDTA to send data. So the data protection test, which has been set out in Article 46, allows you to consider the nature and the volume of data um, in order to decide that the data is protected up to the level of um, the protection in GDPR. So it seems to be, um, if it survives, it's only a proposed piece of legislation at the moment, um, a more simplified risk-based approach written into uh, primary legislation. We've had a question also, and I've got it covering it now, um, as to whether or not the framework applies to the UK. Um, and of course, um, the framework doesn't. Will we get a alternative, an alternative framework? Um, I guess it'd be surprising if, if we didn't do something. The UK has actually said that they're going to try to do some sort of adequacy for transfers to the US. But this particular framework that Camille described for us will have no impact, no, have no effect. Um, will the UK piggyback off the framework in some manner? I mean, we did with the SECs. You can use EU SECs for transfers as long as you sign a UK addendum. So it's possible that the UK will piggyback, especially if we haven't got the, the hardest of Brexiteer governments. Um, but we do have statements from the US that the executive order can be extended to transfers from the UK. So the protections introduced by Biden in relation to um, European well, foreign data, as the order would describe it, will also apply to data from the UK when and if it, the UK is itself designated 
as a qualifying state. Um, so that is all really that we were planning to say. So we've got about five minutes left and there are a whole bunch of questions. Um, so let me see which one we're going to take, uh, Sarah, I think for you. Um, does the decision mean that there is not much room for interpretation in the EDPB's recommendation for supplementary measures? I think I think that's probably right. There's a there's the DPC um, at multiple points said um, that its hands were tied by the EDPB and referred to the guidance and in particular didn't accept any of Meta's criticisms of the EDPB's guidance. Um, there's, it would be interesting to hear if, if the issue behind the question is problems with the um, supplementary measures referred to, because you can see from this decision that Meta had fairly extensive supplementary measures um, were described as comprehensive. It's, it literally just was that it, we couldn't get over the, the prism situation. So um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the, the guidelines are, see, seem to be um, restrictive in any way, but it would be interesting to know if there's a particular issue behind that question that uh, prompted it. Thank you. Well, well, we have the opportunity for an interaction with the question, Sarah, unfortunately. But Camille, you've corrected me in the private chat on what I said about retrospective data. Would you like to tell the audience why I was wrong, please? Yes, sure. So um, I'm just jumping back to that question about um, whether the Biden executive order would have retrospective effect. And actually, the DPC noted in the latest decision that the privacy and civil liberties safeguards introduced by the Biden order do not appear to be intended to apply retrospectively. So um, I think then, strictly speaking, you know, it's not going to, the framework wouldn't rescue transfers that have already taken place. Um, but then as Renzo said, you know, the hope would be that um, regulators would be sort of pragmatic. And if, um, if uh, steps have now been taken um, under the framework that um, perhaps they wouldn't look at retrospective um, transfers, but Know. Yeah, and who knows, yeah. and, being, and being perhaps slightly facetious, of course, what you could do is just send the data all back to Europe um, and then resend it back to the US. So it becomes a little bit of a maybe a, a, a technical point. But that actually um, ties in nicely with another question, Sarah, which is um, you, you, what, what about data if it remains in Europe? You know, so let's assume there's no framework. And actually, Meta did actually have to send all the historic data back. Um, and you know, what's the answer? Can it? What would what would happen um, to you know the transfer discussion if you know Meta simply used European data centres? Um, given the Cloud Act and and the rest of it that's there to uh, as an armory for US government agencies. You're mute to think. Yes, absolutely. And I, I was that addressed to me, Renzo. Apologies, I it, missed it was, part sorry, of what you sorry, said. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it was. Um, but if you didn't get the question, I think the connection is bad. So I think the let me let me let me let me take a stab at it, Sarah, since the connection is bad for you. Um, the yeah, you know, if the data just simply remained in Europe, yet yeah, there is the long arm of the law in the US, but the DPC and EDPB seem to have ignored that. They seem to have ignored the fact that. Um, it's possible for the NSA to get data out of Facebook, even if the data did remain in Europe and was not transferred, um, which, um, and I guess that's a, a conundrum that's possibly just too difficult to solve. Yes, or European subsidiaries of US companies. Yes, completely yep. ignored, I think, not, not yep. considered at all. Absolutely. Yep. 
Thank you. Listen, so we're, we're at the hour uh, of, of 30 seconds to spare. So I want to you know, thank my, my co-presenter, Sarah and Camille, brilliant. Um, thank you, the audience, for, for joining us. Um, as mentioned, we will send slides. We will send a recording. Please do subscribe to our blog. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get invites to in-person events as well if you're, they're convenient for you. Um, the next webinar will also be exploring um, I, Irish DPC consequences, and this time in relation to what they've been saying in, on privacy notices, and Hazel Grant um, will be, uh, the webinar will be called Privacy Notices, a window into a company's compliance, and that is on June the 7th. Thank you very much, everyone.